There will be um, a little quiz. There will be some contrived humour. Uh, there'll hopefully be some learning. And you know, with all, with with any luck, you know, the time will fly by. Anyway, I'm going to give a special shout out. Special shout out on today's webinar to Melissa. Hello, Melissa. We're going to all give you a wave because Melissa is on a train to Scotland. And you know, the, what an effort to be on a webinar, you know, what a way to pass the journey. Yes, on their way to all the way there to Bonnie, Scotland. Time flies by when you're the driver of a train. <laughs> For those of you who remember that. Right, now let's go, oh, what should we do first? Oh, I know what we'll do first. We'll also give a shout out to, to everybody who's here for a second time, or even a third time, or even a fourth time. So here we are. Right. What are we going to talk about today? Right. We're going to talk about customer service and how to make the phone your friend. That's what today is all about. We have the normal rules. Yeah, the normal rules. We are. We are. We're recording this. So it will be available on the Humber Business Growth website. Uh, there is the chat line uh, for your um, for your for ask any questions or you know offer uh, any thoughts. Uh, we have the uh, my, the Twitter at sign and the hashtag for the Grow My SME program. So please feel free to interact. There will be uh, some time for that during the the webinar. So oh, we doesn't know we always we have. To, I'd be disappointed in the audience, wouldn't I, if we didn't start with a quiz? You know, we've got a little few questions to get us. Get us warmed up, you know, a bit of padding as well makes the time fly by, doesn't it? Right, what's first up? Oh, yes, here we go. It's easy, as always. No, you know, true or false. So 70% of unhappy customers whose problems are resolved, are resolved are willing to spend with a business again. True or false? Hmm. Yes, I'm gonna have to hurry. I'm gonna have to hurry. No conferring. Oh, we've got one answer on the old chat line. Oh, yeah, raised a hand. Someone's woman. There we are. So the answer is true. So hopefully uh, you're in. Yeah. And next on the list, surveys have shown that finding new customers oh, costs up to twenty-five times more than retaining existing customers. Mm. So let's try that one. Let's have a little, what does it say on the chat line? What does it say? We've got there. Oh, we have two. Oh, you're quite sharp today, everybody. It is absolutely true. It's somewhere estimated as an average, somewhere around about four, 13, 14 times more expensive to find a new customer than to keep an existing which is the essence of what we're talking about today, customer service. Right, here we go. Next up on the list, 78% of customers who complain to a brand on Twitter expect a response within an hour. Yeah. What do you think? Well, any, 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 you know, uh, it's true. Yes, this is the Spandau Ballet session, it's true. Funny how it seems. You know, uh, if, before you think, I actually do have a life outside of looking up surveys, regurgitating them and putting them in a quiz. I do have a life outside that. Not sure what it is, but I have a, do have a life outside of that. Right, next thing on the list, 67% um, of customers hang up the phone in frustration when they cannot reach a customer service advisor. The answer's on the screen. I don't know why I put that up there. It's true, it's true. Do you know, quick secret, quick secret here. Just between you and me, you know, there's about 14 of us on the, on, I am Aries. And anyone who's, anyone on the chat line who's Aries, you want to put a note up there, you see, we can do this, we can do, we can do that. The chat line, anyone Aries? Because Aries are very determined, very impact. Oh, hang on a second, someone's coming on the chat line, are they Aries as well? Yeah, oh gosh, yeah, yeah. Oh, Melissa, Melissa, your birthday's a day after mine. Just in case you're wondering, 16th of April for me, uh, I'll leave my address, just want to send me a card. Last year I sent myself one. Yeah, so Aries, typically deter, you know, determined, frustrated. Yeah, and I, I'm one of those 67. Yeah, there we go. Right, let's move on. Yeah, good, we'll go. Right, what's up next? What's up next? I can't remember. Oh, got that. Yeah, oh, 72% of customers will tell four people or more if they're having a satisfying experience. Now, no comments now, you're going to make me blush. 
no comments. This is customer service talking about now. Wash your mouth out. That 70 bit customers will tell four more people if they're having a satisfying experience. Oh, false. Everyone's got, oh, some people have got, you see, you know, it's not like three, two, one, this, you know, these questions are understandable. What's the answer? It's false. Six people. Aha. There you are, you see. We'll tell six people. You, you know, and then I think there's a law of diminishing returns. So uh, people tell six and then they get fed up of telling others. But six is quite a number and those six may tell others. So there we go. What's next on the list? Oh, yes. Really, customer service is all about this. All about brand and how you make your customers feel. Yeah, actually, I must confess, it's going to go off on a bit of a tangent for a moment. I'm feeling a bit sad today, you know. I, did, I just heard that um, the inventor of the US, USB stick has died. Uh, I just want to thank him for the memories. <sighs> right, that was today's joke. So I think we're going to get, we better get on with it now. I get, otherwise, you know, they'll get into trouble. Right, where are we? We're going the wrong way. We're going the wrong way. What are we doing? So I showed this slide last week. And really, how you know, this was the last week's slide related very much to brand and marketing and message. But you can clearly out, uh, be ahead of your competitors, be in touch with your audience if you are engaging with your clients. And that's what we'll talk about today in terms of the phone and to make you stand out from the crowd. Now, I'll tell you why I'm saying this, because I think if I put it to the test, each and every one of you really quickly could probably come up with an example of when you've had a good customer service experience and probably a lot quicker you could come up with an example of when you've had a poor customer service experience and you're probably thinking or as, as you as a buyer probably are um, in, in tune if that's the right word in tune or engaged with those places shops online portals whatever it would provide you with the highest quality customer service right you know, with part two, you see, you know, there's no escape today. Part two, what's part two? Oh, yes, it's a good one. Right. The next slide after this is going to give you details of why you think customers actually make a telephone call to a business. Now, I'm going to sit back for 30 seconds and see if anybody can type fast enough on the chat line to give me the principal reason or one of those three reasons why people make a telephone call to a business oh, i'm gonna have a little drink oh i do like a cocktail in the afternoon well do we have any takers we oh, we do we do we're on the chat line <laughs> right to kept christopher thank you very much because they want an immediate response they want a solution to their problem asap Kevin, thank you very much. They want to buy something. So I want immediate response. They want to buy something. Fantastic. Thank you very much. for There we are. And here it comes. Bit of a drum roll. There, Christopher probably wins the brownie point. It's, uh, they can see, as you can see on the right hand side, the survey is a little out of date. And it's an American survey, this one. So there is a little bit of credence associated with it. But principally, to get a problem solved quickly. They want to communicate a complaint to a real person. How many times have we heard that? And they believe it's the best way to receive the correct information. So we've probably all said that. Probably we've all been frustrated at some stage in making a phone call to a business and not been able to achieve to get your problem solved quickly. So you don't need me to tell you this is not a massive surprise. Because customer, and we'll cover it at the end of the webinar, that phone volumes have dropped considerably, as you can see, by 17% over the last five years. Because we have moved into a different world with technology and with the principle of self-service, which is what I'm going to talk about now. I have shown this slide before in a different setting. It's, it's an interesting one by McKinsey and Co relating to what's happened in terms of communication and sales interactions with customers post or you know in the first period of the COVID-19 and the, what we call the pandemic. 
that very much used what he calls traditional sales. And even recently in, that, in 2020, it's shifted to a third and two thirds in this idea about digital interactions and self-service. But of, of the interactions with businesses, the phone is still a very powerful means of delivering great customer service, both reactively and proactively. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So the question is on the screen, why customer service on the phone matters? Well, principally, and, uh, uh, and uh, it is, my next statement is very arguable, but it is probably, magic word, lawyer's word, that one, probably, the most, the best form of interactivity with a business. Ideally, face-to-face -face would be your number one, but the phone is probably the best way to interact. The likes of chatbots, messenger are getting more and more but we can actually build rapport. We can have intonation on the telephone more so than, we, than any other tool. Discuss. Now, why is the ball in the back of the net? Well, I think the reason is this. Much in the same way as we spoke about a moment ago, when somebody rings up a business, they have do it for a reason. They have a goal. The key thing with this, is that the goal of the person ringing up, the customer, the prospect ringing up, is that the person can continue or start to doing business with you. They are making the initial contact. They are ringing for a reason. And so the key thing here is by offering a great experience that's or initial experience that's engaging and personable. You don't need me to tell you that you're far more likely to keep customers loyal and happy. The rules apply across the, across the whole wide world. First impressions count, both if you meet somebody the first time, when you ring somebody up the first time, when you arrive on someone's website, when you see some social media feed, it's that initial experience that shapes the whole customer process then you spend your rest of your time either affirming your initial thoughts or do I, if, if a business may try to um, uh, God, uh, contradict to what you originally thought, as you saw previously, about three quarters of people will give a business a chance. If they have a bad experience, as long as they put it right, I think that's human nature. We're willing to give people a chance. So I have shown this slide in previous webinars. This is the customer journey. So right from the beginning, where we all start life as strangers. So you are endeavoring to, to uh, raise awareness. Then there's a sort of consideration period where they're moving towards a transaction, which is your purchase. Then you're into retention. And in a perfect world, your customers become your best advocates. So we're going to revisit this throughout the Next three quarters of an hour. Right, we'll stick with it. Ha, here's a good one. How do you answer the phone? I'm sorry, let me ask you that question. How do you think you yourself answer the phone? Well, there's only one way to find out is to get your customers to give you some feedback. Uh, but the question I suppose is, is that is there a model way in which to answer the phone? Well, I would strongly suggest you do two things. When you the phone rings, you clear yourself of distractions, number one. The second thing to do is to do what the lady on the screen is doing and smile. And you could either, as that in that situation, get a headset or a means of actually being able to make yourself heard as well as you can so you're all the conditions are right for taking that call and importantly in that scenario the, per, the the lady answering the phone has two hands free one either to type into a computer or potentially to make notes so i would suggest to do that first and foremost now 
First, I'm going to say this now. Please accept my apologies if this is a little bit simplistic or I'm reminding you of what you know already. But for many of you, sometimes it might just be a reinforcement. So we're going to give you some examples. Wait a second. How many of you are ringing up some business, maybe a small business, and you get through to the answering machine? For anyone who's under a certain age, they won't recognize what's on the screen, but it's good, you know, remember them good old days. Now, I'll tell you this. I uh, how, how many times you ring somebody up using their mobile phone and it hits the answering machine? Quite a lot. And what do I get on the end of the answering machine? Well, I'll tell you what I get. Most of the time, and I'll say, oh, most of the time, at least half the time, I get an advert for Vodafone. I'm not. And I'd actually, sometimes I actually doubt myself whether I actually have rung the company. So often I look at my handset, I've actually dialed the right number. So please, if you haven't done so already, I would strongly recommend both for maybe a work phone or for a mobile phone, you get yourself an answering machine message. And I'm just gonna put a couple, two or three examples up on the screen of a atypical answering machine messages. You will get a copy of the slides. I don't expect you to write them down, not that fast. And I'll just read them here. Hi, you've reached, then you put your name of the business. I'm sorry that I'm not available to answer your call at the present time. Please leave your name, number, and a quick message at the tone and return your message as soon as I can. Not quite James Rockford, for those of you who remember the Rockford files, um, but you know, it's, it's a hopefully a simplistic message and you are promising a call to action. The next one, hi, this is X, Y, and Z. I'm either away from my desk or on the phone. Please leave your name and number, short message, and I'll, I'll be sure to get back to you. Shorter and sweeter, similar lines. Here's another one, which is an, uh, way out of hours. You've reached X, Y, and Z business. We're currently closed. Our normal hours are from, please leave a message and return the call when your office opens. Thank you for calling. Now for each and every one of these, you are stating the company name and the call to action is to leave a message, but you are never putting the onus on the customer to ring back. And I think that's quite important. So, Another example there. Uh, uh, so, hello, you've reached the office. I'll be out of the office about an annual leave message. So, you've got, so uh, just to reiterate that point, to think about your answering machine message and some of the tips we're going to offer in a minute about voice. And so, we're now going to hear. Uh, is this an atypical call? Let's hope this works. This was a call. Now, what do you think was good about that call? Or how would you assess the call? Any thoughts on the old chat line? Let's have a look on the chat line. Didn't hear it. Could you hear that? Uh, Catherine said, that should have come around. Hopefully you can hear that. Please turn up your volume if you didn't. I'm gonna to have to, there are one or two other examples. One, some of you heard it, some of you haven't, but it will play through so make sure that your video and your audio are working if you haven't heard them there'll be a transcript of the calls i'll send to you in that situation there the assessment was the time it took to answer the call the speed at which the person spoke the tone of the language and it genuinely felt like they were interrupting somebody it took five rings to answer the call. There is a golden rule in customer service that you should, ideally you would aim to answer in three rings. There is a counter argument to this that some people would argue that you, can, you should answer within one ring. 
but it gives you time to get prepared to answer the call. And sometimes it can sound possibly a little impetuous and hurried. So sometimes go for the three ring principle to answer the phone in three rings. And in this situation, think about the speed at which you speak, the tone of voice, and to think, well, maybe to avoid that situation. So please, I hope this works. Fingers crossed, wind in the right direction. Here's another example. Saying, hopefully you heard that, saying the same thing as we've heard five minutes ago, but a wholly different attitude and perspective. Saying only a handful more words. Assessment of the call would be this. They made the answer of the call in three rings. They sounded positive, professional, clear, and enthusiastic. So you knew who you were talking to, and the voice, I think, sounded fairly, or you would tell me otherwise, welcoming. Now, at this point, I think the key thing is to think of it this way, that you would, you could argue in that call, it said, good morning, ABC Limited, how may I help you? Some people prefer to put their name into the way that the call is answered. So it may become a, an immediate main way it can exchange names and build rapport. But either way, three rings and to introduce yourself in a positive manner. So in this situation, we put, as I said, it's good morning, ABC Limited, how may I help you? May, the choice of the word may replaces can. May is possibly harder, slightly softer, and people prefer may. May I help you? Can I help you? So may I help you is more argue is more serving as opposed to potential with the word can. You pay your money, you take your chance. In the other scenario I mentioned, good morning, this is. In that situation, the lady was Louise. This is Louise from ABC Limited. How can I help you? The one thing I would clearly advise to do is to make sure that you, you have your, what I call opening correct and everybody, and I mean everybody in the company answers the phone in a similar way. That is known as brand, brand building, brand identity, and high quality customer service. The second thing I'd advise you to do, as we saw the example earlier, is when you are, even if you are parked in the car in a lay-by or you're up a, up a ladder or wherever you may be, it would be possible to get yourself a pen and paper or a means of making notes. Because that will help with listening. You only have to put bullet points down, but it's so much more powerful if you are making notes. If you turn the clock back, here's a quick anecdote. If you turn the clock back about nine or 10 years, there was, the, remember the very first prime ministerial debate with Nick Clegg, David Cameron, and Gordon Brown. And Nick Clegg was perceived to have won the debate. And the reason why he won the debate was, was it was afterwards that when people were asking questions of him to the, all three of them, he made a note of their name. And he answered the question, using the person's name. If you ever see a very clever politician on question time or elsewhere, somebody from the audience will give their name and ask a question. And if a person responds with the answer using that person's name, it is very empathetic and it shows you have listened. Tip of the day. Right, the next thing is to think about the three C's. What are they, Simon? Oh, I don't know. Let's have a look. It think about the voice. Oh, oh yeah, they, they contrived really that one. Think about the voice. So you think about those. So the voice really should be three C's: confident, 
cheerful and clear. Confident, cheerful and clear. So when you think about the voice, okay, can, am I allowed to do this? Can I have a quick anecdote? Quick anecdote. I was once on an aeroplane flying over uh, to, um, to Asia. Tom Jones was on the flight and we were queuing up and I was standing next to him. And I must admit, I didn't realise he wasn't that, he wasn't very tall. I'm, I'm six foot three and I was standing next to him and I had this impression in my head, he was a tall bloke. And it's not until you see somebody face to face standing next to him that I realised he wasn't as tall as he thought. There we go. But doesn't he look better? Now his hair's like that. There we go. Quick anecdote. There we go. It's not unusual for me to say that about Tom. Huh, right, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move on. The other tip I'll offer, when you are ringing, when somebody is ringing you up, make sure you smile. There you are. Not like Lois and Gromit though, to smile. But the key thing here is not the over the top. Oh, try a picture. But it, when you go, some of you might be familiar with American style customer service. It can sound a little overzealous. So to be smiling and but to sound enthusiastic without sounding ingratiating. So are we up for another one? A little bit of clarification sometimes is needed when somebody rings up. So think of it this way, one of the biggest issues you often face when we all do it, when you meet somebody for the first time, either on the phone or face to face, how often do you forget someone's name or didn't hear their name? So I'm absolutely, and I'm really sorry, the one or two of you cannot hear those calls, so I do apologize. I'm gonna to have to send those links through. Quite a few, a few of you couldn't hear, so I'm going to just to pass on my apology if you cannot hear. So I'm gonna try, try and do a little something, but the key thing in that learning exercise, the person rung up, they didn't hear their name. So I'll repeat it for those of you who didn't hear. The message was, hello, my name's Callum. And, and the, the caller, the uh, responder on the phone said, I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch your name. Please, would you be kind enough to repeat it? So you're building empathy. So it, it's no harm in doing it. And it, again, it shows that you are listening. Right. This is the key point, moving on to active listening. If you, I'm going to quickly check the chat line. Right. I do apologize. People haven't heard the calls. So I'm going to have to uh, send the transcript through and just change things very slightly. Please accept my apologies. Active listening means hearing everything they have to say and basing your response on their comments and not a prescribed script. That's the idea about having a pen and paper and without distraction free and really listening hard. So that is active listening. And it generally proves that you're in the present and you're empathetic. There is nothing more soul destroying when you ring somebody up and then don't appear to be listening. It is, you perceive to be rude, ignorant, whatever, but if you are, but if it's the other way around and someone is really listening hard, it shows that you're actually on it. And, and it's a, I think it's a far better customer experience. Often it's the same case when someone's starting a presentation to anybody, uh, in, a, in a room, you would try and qualify if they're hearing, or someone's doing a webinar where they can't hear the interactions. Oh dear, that's me. So, a, a, a good person versus a bad salesperson. Not great fan of the terminology, but the real thing is just to focus on the top two. Good listener, 
talks over the customer, asks questions, assumes everything. All the other points we'll, we'll co cover later, but good listening and asking questions is the essence. Now the key next thing here is, to, so three rings, introduce yourself, the, the three C's, to actively listen and critically now to use positive words. What does Simon mean about use positive words? Well, I'll tell you. Please, please avoid these phrases. I, I, I don't know. I can't. You have to. And you can turn these things into more positive experiences. If somebody's ringing up asking for something, we'd be, you know, happy to help. We would be, we would be happy to. You are delivering options. So if you say you can't do it, and I'll give you an example in a moment of an experience I had had, which was here. And it was it was a double fold experience. One was on an evening and one was in the morning. The evening one, I was staying away, the Premier Inn fairly recently, and I was in the, the restaurant there and somebody walked in wanting a table. And I was, I was a, a few yards away at my table. And this is not a phone call, but it's a customer service. And I'll illustrate in a moment. The person asked, do you have, you know, do you have a table free? And the answer was, I don't have one at the moment. Can you come back later? And that person just turned on their heels and walked out the door. The next one was the following morning at breakfast, somebody rang, rang up and said, can I book breakfast? I heard the, the phone call because I was standing next to the guy at the bar and the very words came coming back, which stunned me, were, you've got no chance, mate. It's eat out to help out. We've got a hundred people coming for breakfast. You've got no chance, mate. We've got a hundred people. It's eat out to help out. We've got a hundred people coming for breakfast. Now, in those situations there, it would be, I'm, you know, I'm really sorry. We are full at the moment. We can't, we can't help you. Or what time would you like to come? Because for all I know, they may want to come at 10 o'clock at the end of breakfast rather than at that precise moment in time. They fell into the trap of not listening and not responding appropriately. Now, I saw the person walk out the door. I, can't, I don't know what happened on the end of the phone call, but I see it so often in actually, they may want to deliver it and there's no, no uh, aggression or unpleasantness other than they're delivering a fact to the customer but they're delivering it in such a um, such a, a draconian manner that it's not something to be suggested. So just go back to these. I don't know, I can't, you need to. Replace it with this. I'm gonna try and give you an example here. So does everybody know, here's a good quick question. Does anyone know what an SPO is? Oh, ho, ho, ho. The chat line is on SPO. Any takers for an SPO? I'll give you the clue. First word is sales. Sales prevention officer. A term that was very prevalent in the uh, a little while ago, less so now, but you can probably all, for those of you who've worked with certain companies or seen things happening, that you will actually um, we know the people who are there who do almost anything they can or inadvertently in lots of situations to uh, to be prevent sales from happening. Now, can I get this to work? I'm going to. It's, I mean, it's the highest volume. I just, I'm going to run this and I please, if uh, you can't hear it, I do apologize. I don't know what I can do otherwise, but I'm going to run this little example now and I'll try and paraphrase for you who can't hear it. Hi, quick chat. 
is Andrew. It's a great point. I'm going to have I shared. Gentleman has asked screen audio, so I'm going to have a little. Just going to try and. I'm going to try and. If I can't get it to work, just bear with me a tick. And this is on the hoof. Hide video panel screen. Gentleman suggested on the thing to to change the screen audio. There we go. Let's try this screen audio. This is on the hoof stuff. I'm going to suggest I'm unable to do that. So I do apologize if you cannot hear that. That that call. I will, I will reiterate what happened. So Somebody rang up saying, hello, I'll, I'll paraphrase it now. Hello, fast print um, was, the, was the way the call was answered. The customer said, can you do some printing within 24 hours? And the customer service at fast print said these words, uh, we're really busy. I'm not sure we can do that. Andy's on his lunch. Can you ring back in an hour? And the, the client said, okay, I'll, I'll do that. Cheers. So. I haven't done it as well as on the call, but the, the learning thing is there is never to put the onus on the customer. And the way we're really busy, can you ring back in an hour? Now, you'd like to think in these modern ways, but I've seen it myself at the Premier Inn and the, and the Brewers Fair, to my own experience, that never put the onus on the customer, take the customer's details, and even if you have to ring them back, you do so yourself. You take the customer's information and you call them back. So to be a sales prevention officer. Right, because the key thing here is that that person is ringing up with a goal. He wanted to buy. So the idea, you, got a, you had a sales lead staring you in the face. Right. The key thing here is to create an opportunity. And I think it would be unwise for me to run this audio because it's going to be a little bit frustrating for people who can't hear. But the whole essence of this is to think about, let's skip these through, is that you actually, the example we were going to show was relating to upselling. So just want to cover this point on an inbound call. Somebody is asking for X. And you all, it's great you can help them with X, but then you also want to upsell to them. So the key thing when you're talking about upselling or cross-selling, in effect, you want to offer them or additional product or additional service. You have to earn the right. So you won't get that first up. You need to have some empathy and to have some buying signals and before you have the opportunity. Key thing is always listen for clues. So if somebody's ringing up a builder's merchant asking for sand, you wouldn't just have a delivery of sand taking place. Highly unlikely. They may also want cement, bricks, blocks, gravel. And there's probably numerous examples. The classic was McDonald's. If you want fries with that, the old, the old joke about that, but there's always opportunities to upsell and to listen for clues. If you have a system in place and a customer has rung up and you have the capability to look on your internal system, you can see what they have bought or not bought and how they have behaved. So you can actually earn your own right by interrogating the system as you speak. Often one of the best ways is to gauge a customer 
by planting seeds. So early in the call, you could actually say, you know, um, you're dealing with their issue, but you all the time, you may be asking questions relating to what you may propose a little bit later. And that's the critical thing, to ask questions. So in the scenario I painted about somebody ringing up wanting print, they may also want other things rather than just print brochures or print business cards or they may want posters, they may want it digitally, they, who knows, they may want a website building. You don't know. And critically, is always where possible to ask for the sale or at least ask for the next step. Right. I'm not going to show an example of us. I'm going to skip that one because it's another uh, message. If people can't hear, I do apologise. So I'll, I'll make we'll make these available on the recording. Right. Time is short. We've covered about 40 minutes on inbound calls. Just wanted to cover outbound calls and the future of customer service, if I may. From my experience. One of the biggest fears business people have, shout me down if I'm wrong, is making an outbound call and particularly making what may be known to be a cold call. If somebody rings up a business and leaves a message or sends an email through saying, I'm interested in your X, Y, and Z, please can you call me? It's almost I'm going to suggest people wouldn't think twice about ringing that person back. It's a warm lead. But the mindset is, is when you're ringing somebody up who maybe have stopped buying from you or you've got a hint of an opportunity. This is a huge mindset change. So you have to have the attitude, I think, that you don't mind fearing rejection. It's back to the issue of customer journey. If somebody has brought awareness, you brought your product or service to be made aware, or you've sent them a quotation, why shouldn't you be phoning them up to see if the quotation is acceptable or not to them? You've done all this effort and trouble. I'll give you an example. I was helping out a um, mechanical and um, heating engineering business in Wakefield and we we're going through the sales process and I, I was there the first day and I was just going asking lots of questions and I asked them about their customers and their conversion rates and they believe it or not I find it hard to believe still that they'd actually sent 30 quotations to one particular building contractor in response, they'd ask them to tender as a subcontractor to them. And they hadn't had one order or even one piece of feedback. And I said, well, why not? And I said, well, we probably think we're too much. I said, have you actually telephoned the customer to find out why? Probably not the best question to, um, to ask on your first morning, but <laughs> it was one I was determined to ask, and they hadn't. And it's surprising how many businesses are reluctant to ring up. They'd prefer to hide behind the screen or hope the customer will ring them up. So you are faced with a situation where you either have had an inquiry, you've got a dormant customer, or there's an opportunity. Are you going to pick up that phone? Well, I think the cards are stacked in your favor now. Um, you've got opportunity mobile phone, people are remote working, you've got so many different ways in which you can actually call them. So, give you a little tip here in terms of an outbound call and a process to follow. And it's basically just a starting point to get you through those initial calls, and it's called pair. Pair. We don't need a conference for this pair. So, pair. Outbound. First bit is is the personal introduction when you're ringing up and you adopt the same principles as we saw in the phone calls that you actually speak clearly and confidently and one of the tip here you might want to think about is actually you making that call is to smile as I said before but also here's a one for you to stand up 
If you stand up making a telephone call, it's easy to breathe, you're more assertive, and you may gain more confidence. The second thing to think about is actually turning off distractions, your own phone, etc. You're in your, your emails pinging into your system. So make a P for personal introduction. The E is to establish your company's credentials. The A to awaken the customer's interest. R is permission to proceed. And I'm going to give you a worked example now. So it follows on from the calls we've received in. But good morning, Mr. Well, good morning, John. My name, or I am John Smith from ABC Limited. Said clearly and concisely, good morning. That's your personal introduction. You're explaining your reason for ringing. In this situation, as a customer inquiry, I look after customer inquiries relating to ABC products. The key thing here is to keep it short and sweet. You're giving the opportunity here, these two are statements, but you are, it's clear. I look after customer inquiries. My name is John Smith, ABC Limited. Now, the awaken the interest. My reason for phoning is in connection with your recent order for sand and building materials for the site in Bridlington. So he's ordered stuff, but he hasn't ordered for a long time. You're telling him, well, oh, and you would hope at that point there may be some engagement or some discussion. The critical thing here, and this is where you take a slight risk, also one of courtesy, with the R, requesting permission to continue. If it's okay with you, please could I have two minutes of your time? Now, he has two options as, as the customer ring up. He can say, I'm really busy. Well, if you say he's really busy, when can I call you back? Or he may say, yes, let's just make it two minutes. So if you, if you give you a, 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 a car at the moment, then you clarify the time in which to call back. Or if you've got two minutes, make sure it's two minutes and say, right, yeah, well, let's keep it short and sweet. You've had sand, you know, would look, what else can, you know, it's going in then to a sales discussion. Usually you would follow on with a question. But think of it this way, in your own situation, personal introduction, establish your company credentials, awaken the customer's interest, request position, permission to proceed. Not to have a script but have a framework for making these discussions, making these calls out. This is for a call out, a proactive call to a customer. Okay, so I hope that's helped. I was, I was going to show an example. Now, you, may, you want to load the dice in your favour. So then, when do you think, statistically, the best days to call are? Hmm. Any stabs on the chat line? Well, the best days to call statistically are. Oh, got an answer here. What's the answer? Friday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Oh, we're working here. Wednesday. Statistically, it's estimated you're more likely. Not saying it's the it's more likely to get a conversion, an opportunity on a Wednesday. Now, this is a very broad brush statement because it will depend so much on your industry and your scenarios. But you think carefully that you may choose to make many of your calls to customers on specific days. You may say a graveyard day could potentially be a Friday afternoon, but then your clients may be sitting at the desk tidying up paperwork or on the on on doing doing administrative work their phone may be a welcome distraction but likely it may or not so statistically you can see the answer it's wednesdays and thursdays Ooh. how many times do you call hey now any takers on that how many times do you call when i do Customer service training. We do these examples. We've got two, two, 
Two answers on the chat line. Oh, Duncan, seven to nine. Well, Duncan, you're, you're on the case today. Who else has answered? We've got Christopher two times a day. The answer is that it estimated it will somewhere take about six attempts. Scary or persistent, call it what you will. But it takes quite some time to make contact with clients. Now, the issue often cropped up on this particular point is some people say, oh, I don't want to be a stalker or I'm happy to, to persist. Now, most, most salespeople or people following up give up after one or two attempts. So my advice to you is to be persistent, but to ring up, to keep at it, but not to ring up every day on the hour, to choose your moments, to choose different times to reach that person, but be persistent. And the best times to call. Hmm. Any takers on the best times? What have we got here? Any answers on best times? Well, statistically, conscious of the time, the best times to call are. Oh, can I move on? There you are. I haven't got, I haven't got, it's estimated middle of the day, end of the day. Best time to call often is between seven. Sorry, the whole slide has gone a little bit skew with. It's estimated towards the middle of the afternoon or the middle of the morning are perceived to be the best at times to make calls. So you may want to choose that. Now I'm not suggesting for one minute you ring up at three o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon and that's the only time for calling out, but statistically maybe helping yourself in that situation. Often the best way is to actually see the times you've made calls successfully previously or talk to them, or when you're making your first or second call, is actually to say, when is the best time to call you? And if you have a CRM system or a database, you can record that. Which moves swiftly along to the next point, is that I would strongly recommend, and I say this almost every week, with your customers to have things as automated as best as possible and to have like sort of a CRM system. There are lots of them, but to follow your customers through the journey. There are many I mention each week, like Zoho and Cycli, HubSpot, etc. Many of them out there for small businesses, but to record all your interactions with your customers, and you can actually dial out from these um, from these systems as well, and email out as well. So. I'm going to go through things just very quickly to finish off today is to talk about some of the latest trends in customer service. So your phone is important, but it's an inbound and an outbound perspective, but things are shifting. So the trend to move towards people shopping on social media is a huge trend. And most people follow retailers on consumers for two reasons, as you can see on the slide there, to learn more about sales, to keep up with new products. The second thing is developing, and you'll see it all now for many businesses, is to have a chat bot as a customer service tool. So in this situation, as you can see on the screen there, many of you will be probably communicating with some businesses, consumer-based mainly, big businesses, that way but even then with the likes of making a dental appointment so if you depending on the nature of your business you may do something called omni-channel marketing so you may have a customer service center with phone and then using social media as well or your website because that's the next point is about what is known as omni-channel marketing you probably want to have more than one avenue for delivering customer service. In this situation, it's customer service through a chatbot and through social media. Now, Starbucks is an interesting one. The key thing here is about 
personalization and the, the, the whole, the, this is it with data that marketing becomes targeted. So the apps they're using now for ordering are so clever and they know exactly what you have bought in the past, your name, where you've bought it, how often you've bought it, that they will then suggest additional items to buy. And often if you're ordering it by an app and then going collecting it, there's a personalization to the whole process. So it becomes that way. This is around now and can be part of a small business environment, which combines all the aspects of what we spoke about, but it's to personalize things. So when you're ringing up, you personalize it. When you're emailing, you personalize it. And when you're using artificial intelligence, as we see here, it's all personalized. But absolutely critically, till the day I shuffle off this planet, I'm still, still, still to deliver a great customer experience is absolutely critical. Even just down to simple stuff like this, with people putting information on their website or Google My Business or through social media or through an answer machine, you are communicating all the time with your customers and being proactive giving people a great customer service. Virtually every survey on customer experience will tell you that it's the, how business is won and how business is lost. And lead on to the final point is the development of artificial intelligence and to automate things, which will be the next staging post that you'll see now and then ultimately for smaller businesses. So, Artificial intelligence is next up. I would like to thank you for attending today. I'm going to sincerely apologize for not having those recordings available. I will endeavor to make sure they're available on the video recording. So please accept my apologies. It did take a little bit off today's webinar. I can't do any more than say I'm sorry and hope it didn't dampen your experience. And if you would like to be back for more next week, we are talking about public relations. So we'll be here at two o'clock next Tuesday. The following Tuesday, I'll be coming along here with a colleague who is going to talk about how to sell on Amazon and eBay. So you've got PR next week. You've got Amazon and eBay. So the recording's available. Questions I'm now going to take on the chat line. And I'm going to thank you all for being in attendance. Are there, and I'm going to answer any questions. Yes, Melissa's asked a question. Are there any CRMs you would recommend for an SME? Always a dangerous ground, this one, but the two I've used and clients have used are Zoho, Z-O-H-O, and HubSpot. There too, HubSpot is free. Zoho, I think also is very, is free for limited usage. And they integrate with lots of, uh, other tools. I'd lo recommend looking at those. Gemma has said, do you have any tips for dealing with unhappy clients? Wow, that's a topic in itself. I'll answer that one. The, the Disney philosophy is very much to, uh, the, 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 and I'll send a link through to you on this subject about how to deal with unhappy clients in, in, in 10 seconds. It's about identifying the issue, dealing with the issue, and following up the issue. Understand what the problem is and solving it in the right way. And they use the herd um, uh, principle of dealing with unhappy clients. And I'll make sure you get a copy of that. So answer the question very succinctly. I do apologize for giving you a very fast answer. Right, Christopher, what's your advice on voicemails and when to know when it's better or not to leave one? That's a fantastic question. Now, I've heard all sorts of things on that point. Never leave a voicemail, leave an inquisitive one, or leave a one that would lead to something else. My personal opinion is to leave a voicemail and to say, for example, let's say I'm ringing you, hello, Christopher, I'm sorry I missed you. I'd love to be able to talk to you about X. I will be ringing you back on X date. That's one I've used quite successfully. If you try and leave a longer one, it may 
give you little room to maneuver. So, you know, you, or you're just experimenting, but that, that would be the advice I would offer. Any other questions? Oh, I missed anybody. Oh, one new message. Please, can I have it on the, oh, yeah, you will have a, co have a copy of the document, how to an unhappy customer. I will, I've got everybody's email address. So you'll get a copy of the slides. You'll get an invitation to next week and I'll make sure you get a copy to the link of the how to deal with customers just following the method that's used by the likes of, of uh, the Disney Corporation. The other way to look at a complaint is to turn it into a positive. So for example, <laughs> If somebody has a hotel, use an example, or a meal, or a con you know, someone's complaining, and you put it right, you are, do you are delivering good customer service and be seen to putting it right. So often, then it's about, as I mentioned earlier, people will give you the second opportunity because we know things don't go right, as I have found out for myself today. But so, so you found, so I turn it into an opportunity. Gosh. And are there any other questions? I don't think so. Oh, hasn't time flown by? Three o'clock? Gosh. Well, without further ado, then, if there's no more questions, I will say a few things. Thank you very much for being here today. Thank you for bearing with me for not uh, on the issue of the sound. If you'd like any help, it, just drop me a line. As I always mention each week, there is one-to-one -one funded marketing support. We can cover those issues for you. There's webinars every, every Tuesday, and I'll say I'll make sure you get the copy of the information. So it could be time to go outside, enjoy a bit of sunshine. But thank you very much. Until next Tuesday, adieu.